In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor and sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, our Maker and Redeemer, you wonderfully created us, and in the incarnation of your Son, yet more wondrously restored our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in him who made himself to be like us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday of Christmas is from Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Galatians chapter 4. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. We stand. Alleluia. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he has put on strength as his belt. Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the second chapter. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice, according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. 
Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts for many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was eighty-four. She did not depart from the temple, worshipping and fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in what...
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. There is joy in what Simeon confesses, and there is warning as well. There is peace with God, and there is conflict for those who remain. The Messiah has come according to his word. The Gentiles have their light, Israel has its glory, and Simeon can finally depart in peace. And yet this very same child, the joy of the faithful, is appointed for the fall and rising of many. He is a sign that many will oppose, piercing the heart of his own mother, and families will be divided because of him. There is joy in what Simeon confesses as his, ga- his, as his eyes gaze upon the promised Messiah and he holds in his arms the world's very Savior. But there is warning as well. For to be the world's Savior and to enable sinners to depart in peace, the child must suffer. And all who follow him will likewise suffer too. There is joy and there is warning the first Sunday of Christmas. Hear his words again. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now, nowhere in Holy Scripture are we told whether or not Simeon walked out of the temple that day and dropped dead, right? We don't know how long he lived after his beautiful confession, but we do know that he was enabled to die in peace. That was the confidence with which he spoke. And the point is is the same, whether he died instantly or some time later on. The promise of God had been fulfilled. His eternal peace had come with the world's Savior, the Lord's own Christ. Simeon could now die, resting in the peace that passes all understanding, knowing that he would die, that if he would die, yet would he live. For the Lord had kept his promise, which means the Lord would keep all his promises. There is joy in Simeon's song, to be sure. In fact, I myself have witnessed the very same sort of joy on a number of occasions and with this exact text. Usually, it's at the bedside of a beloved saint, a dear child of God on his or her deathbed. Everyone can tell that the that the end is drawing near and that death is imminent. And so I bring along my trusty pastoral care companion and I pray with the, the, the ill person and any family or friends who are gathered the commendation of the dying. And the goal is always the same. To fill up that person and any family or friends who are gathered with the clear and certain promises of God. We start with the invocation, which immediately, with the Trinitarian name and the sign of the cross put upon that person's forehead, is a reminder that he or she has been baptized into Christ. Then we pray. We confess our sins. We receive God's forgiveness and holy absolution. I read Psalm 23, and we pray again. Then, depending on on the time available, I will read various passages of Scripture, mostly the clear promises of Jesus himself. Often I read the death of Christ and the Easter account of his resurrection, as well as that vision from St. John's Revelation of all the saints standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white with palm branches in their hands, shouting forth their praises to God. Then we confess the creed, pray the litany for the dying, the Lord's Prayer, 
And then finally, I will put my hand on their forehead, that precious child of God, and I will speak his or her name. And I will say these words. Go in peace. May God the Father who created you, may God the Son who redeemed and saved you with his blood, May God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you in the water of holy baptism receive you into the company of saints and angels to await the resurrection and live in the light of his glory forevermore. Amen. And what do you think comes next? Well, immediately after having said those words, I, along with anyone who is gathered there that is able, speaks the words of Simeon. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace according to your word. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. Finally, I, I'll sing a hymn and offer a, a final benediction. I have been with some of you when I've prayed those prayers and spoken those words. And some of you have heard me talk about this at a funeral. But I can't tell you how many times that it has happened that I've, I've done this, filling this child of God up with the promises of God, concluding with those words of Simeon, and then shortly thereafter, received the phone call that the Lord had indeed received into his presence our dearly departed brother or sister in Christ. And you know what? When it happens this way, every single time, there is joy. There is joy because of the promise of God. Like Simeon, our dear brother or sister in Christ, has indeed been able to depart in peace according to God's promise. Now, of course, you don't have to wait until your deathbed to be filled up with the promises of God or to rest in peace. In fact, just think about when you most often hear these words of Simeon. Every single Saturday evening or Sunday morning as we gather together to be filled up with the promises of God. Having heard that same invocation. Having confessed our sins and received God's forgiveness and holy absolution. Having heard once again the words of the prophets and the apostles and the words of Jesus himself in the Holy Gospel. And then having the word proclaimed to us for our benefit. And then, according to his word and by his own institution, the Lord Jesus places his body and blood and bread and wine and gives them to us Christians to eat and to drink so that having our sins forgiven... And having the Lord Jesus Christ himself unite himself to us, we would be those who taste and see that the Lord has once again kept his promise and enabled us to be those who depart in peace according to his word. Have you ever thought about that? How appropriate it is, having received that sort of gift, to join with Simeon and sing his song. As one faithful pastor has put it, we go to the sacrament as if going to our death so that we can go to our death as if going to the sacrament to see Jesus. To receive Christ, according to his own word, to behold in our own body the world's Savior and the one who allows us to depart in peace. <laughs> Indeed, there is joy in Simeon's confession, and we share this joy because, like him, we have beheld this child as well. 
But we mustn't forget that in Simeon's words was also given a warning. This child who gives us joy and allows us to depart in peace will be rejected by men and himself be a man of sorrows. His mother's heart will be pierced as she watches her son suffer and die. The sign given by God but rejected by those he came to save. What we know to be good for us is terrible for him. And make no mistake, his rejection didn't end when the crowd had finally stopped calling for his death. No, his rejection continues on still today among Gentiles who refuse to acknowledge his light and among Jews who fail to give him glory. His rejection continues on still today as those infected uh, with the sin of Adam fail to behold him as he has come, wrapping himself up in the foolishness of words that are preached and salvation given in water, bread, and wine. His rejection continues on still today, even among those who would claim his name and dare to call themselves Christians, but refuse to go and see him, and behold him, and hear him, and receive him as he has now promised to come. His rejection continues on still today among us. And so our hearts must be those that along with Mary's are pierced by the law so that we might be drained of selfish idolatry and be renewed according to his word and spirit in the joy of our salvation, which alone is Christ the Lord. Think about it. Here we are, just days after celebrating the birth of Christ and still counting the days of Christmas. It's the seventh day of Christmas, by the way. And yet already we are ready to move on and to put Jesus back into the boxes where we like to keep him safely distant so that he doesn't affect our preferred way of living. Now, I realize I may be preaching to the choir here a bit, as you are those who are gathered here for the divine service. But this sin has infected us all. I may have said this to some of you. I know I've mentioned it with the fifth and sixth graders I'm teaching in the school. But we have grown bored with the gifts of God. And the more I think about it, the more I think about this problem of our boredom, the more I am convinced that it simply reveals our own sinful nature in the worst kind of way. I mean, we tend to think that if we've become bored with something, the fault is with the thing we've become bored with, right? A bad movie, or a poor public speaker, or... I don't know, a, a, a bad concert, right? The fault is with the thing we paid money to go and see. It should have entertained us and kept us awake. But I'm not sure that's right. At least not when we're talking about the gifts God gives us in Christ Jesus. Gifts upon which our very life and faith depend. I think the problem with our boredom says more about us than it does about the gifts of God. I mean, that which Simeon longed to see, and that which is so important to a child of God on his or her deathbed, is that which we've become bored with. So that irregularity has become the new normal and complete inactivity has become commonplace. And I'm not just talking about the activities that take place during the week, 
I'm simply talking about the regular weekly gathering of the people of God. Can you imagine Peter or the other disciples telling Jesus that they had had enough of his word? We've heard the Sermon on on the Mount, Jesus. I don't really want to sit here for the Sermon on the Plain. Or we heard you teach us yesterday. I think I've had about enough and I can I, I can take it or leave it now for the next few weeks. No, Peter replies to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. But we've become bored. Jesus is present in the divine service. He's here. The world's Savior is in this place. He's the one speaking when His Word is read in Holy Scripture and the pastor proclaims this is the Word of the Lord. And we're glad it's over. For if there is a reading that's too long, right, we, we start to wonder when it's going to end. He's the one preaching when what is preached is true and spoken in his name. But if what is spoken makes us squirm because it reveals our sin, we become upset. But we've forgotten that it's his own word. And yet here it is comforting us, giving us life week after week after week. But if the pastor's not, I don't know, well-spoken enough or handsome enough or young enough or if he's too old or goes on too long, we think it's not worth listening to. And he's the host who gives himself as the meal when he puts bread from heaven on this table so that you and I might be ourselves those who are made able to depart in peace. During vacation Bible school, I took the children on a couple field trips. One day we went over to the parsonage so I could show them how mission in the home took place. And we talked about how uh, we share God's word right here in the home. And we forgive one another our sins and make sure that our children know who Jesus is and all the stories that go with it. But another field trip was taken right here into the sanctuary to teach them about the mission of God. And I asked all the kids who were gathered, of course you know that they're not all Lutheran, but I, I asked them if they had ever heard God speak to them. And they were like, uh, no. Uh, because they were thinking of some mystical voice in, in their head. And so they were all amazed when in fact I told them that If they had gathered here at Trinity or at Holy Cross or one of our other churches in the area or one of their own Christian congregations and heard the scriptures read to them, then in fact they had heard God speak to them. And then from there we talked about the words that God had spoken to them from the Father. And the words God speaks to them from the pulpit. And the meal he gives to the whole church from his altar every Sunday. As he feeds God's people with his own body and blood. I wonder what would happen. If we put a sign up and an ad in the paper. And told everyone around that... that, that Jesus Christ, the world's Savior, was going to be here in this place on Saturday evening at 6.30 p.m., and then again on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And that Jesus Christ himself would be here to give you the gifts that enable you to die in peace. What do you think would happen? Would people show up? 
Or would they respond like normal? Like those invited to the wedding feast in Jesus' parable who could come up with all kinds of reasons to be elsewhere. (coughs) Indeed, Simeon's confession is full of joy and also includes a sobering warning. The child who is born as a light to the Gentiles and as the glory of his people Israel is a child who would become a man of sorrows acquainted with grief as those for whom he came would receive him not. And his grief continues still today. Indeed, it's his grief that lays us bare and reveals the sin in our hearts. His sorrow shows us who we really are. A people who tire of His gifts, who grow bored with His own word and are able to put Jesus back on the shelf and hold Him at a distance until it is that we think we finally have a need. But being revealed for who we are is exactly what we need. And having our hearts revealed is His own good work for our benefit. It's what He does in us this first Sunday of Christmas so that we would be those renewed in Him. He creates in us a new heart. He renews a right spirit within us. He does not cast us away, though we have cast Him away, but on the contrary. He renews us once again by coming to to us with His own word and promise. He restores in us the joy of His salvation and the desire to be where Jesus is. For where Jesus is, that is where He will always be making those who are gathered, those who are able to depart in peace. That's what he promises. Merry Christmas. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God that transcends all our understanding guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. The service continues as we stand and sing together the offertory as printed in the bulletin.
two updates uh, for the prayers this morning, both uh, news of joy. Michaela Ives has had her baby boy. Bennett Milo was born on Friday, and so we give thanks to God for the gift of life. And also Audrey Aby, a relative of some of you, for whom we've been praying, had her daughter yesterday, Sophia Rose. And so with both of those families, we rejoice at the gift of life. Also want to make sure you all receive the announcement that the Christmas cantata has been postponed one week and will occur next Sunday evening at 4 o'clock here at Trinity. We stand for prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the year that is almost over, in thanksgiving to God for all the good we were permitted to give and receive, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the year that is almost here, that God would continue to watch over us and bless us, and that he would give us opportunity to serve our neighbor and tell others the good news of his son, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For patience and vigilance as we await the return of Christ, that God would keep us ever faithful and ready with our lamps burning, always awake and ready, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our government, military, first responders, and all who serve us in the civil realm, that they would use the authority and responsibility given to them to serve God's will, protect the innocent, administer justice, and provide for the needy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who do not confess the faith, that God would give them opportunity to hear the gospel and believe, and that we would always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are sick, lonely, homebound, and in mourning, that God would grant them healing, companionship, comfort, and the sure and certain knowledge that nothing can separate them from His love in Christ Jesus. Especially we remember John, Jay, Judy, Larry, Milton, Sarah, Tracy, David, Juanita, Charles, Marcia, Rudy, Laura, Ron, and Evan. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For mothers with child, that they be sustained throughout their pregnancies. For children newly born, that mothers and fathers be equipped for the task ahead and bring their new child to the font to receive new birth by water and the Spirit. And for all families in Christ, that the home be made strong by the word of Christ, which is confessed therein, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who commune at this altar, that the body and blood of Christ would keep them firm in the one true faith to life everlasting, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, we are bold to ask you, Lord, because you have made us your people and members of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <laughs>